In this video, we're going to continue talking about charitable trusts. And specifically, we're going to begin talking about the public benefit requirement. So we've already seen a little bit about charities and we saw in section one that a charity is defined as an institution which is established for charitable purposes only. And section two defines a charitable purpose as one which falls within section three one and is for the public benefit. So there is this further aspect to the legal definition of a charity. There is a requirement of a public benefit. So in order for there to be a charitable purpose, not only must it fall within section 3.1, which we've looked at in my previous videos, but it must also serve a public benefit. And it's only if both of these things are satisfied, does there exist a charitable purpose under section two of the Charities Act 2011. Section 4, subsection 3 of the Charities Act says that any reference to the public benefit is a reference to the public benefit as that term is understood for the purposes of the law relating to charities in England and Wales. So public benefit isn't actually defined in the Act. Instead, what section 4, subsection 3 tells us is that any reference to the public benefit is a reference to the public benefit as the term is understood for the purposes of the law relating to charities in England and Wales. So what section 4, subsection 3 is saying in a very roundabout way then is that the public benefit or the meaning of public benefit carries its common law meaning. So the definition of public benefit is located in judicial decisions prior to statutory reorganisation. Now we have some charity commission guidance and the charity commission's public benefit objective is to promote awareness and understanding of the operation of the public benefit requirement. The charity commission under the act, as you may recall from my previous videos, have a number of objectives, functions and duties. Now, among these objectives is the public benefit objective. This objective obliges the Commission to promote awareness and understanding of the, op of the operation of this public benefit requirement. The Commission must you know, issue guidance on the operation of the public benefit requirement as stated within Section 17 of the Charities Act. So pursuant to the above objective, the Charity Commission must issue guidance on the operation of this public benefit requirement. The Commission's current guidance can be found by following this link, which I will put in the comments section below. Okay, so this is their current guidance on the public benefit requirement. The two aspects. So how does the court approach the question as to whether or not a given purpose is for the public benefit? Now, in theory, the question of public benefit could be tackled by simply asking whether a charitable purpose is for the public benefit. So, you know, they have the purpose before them and then they can ask in a kind of global holistic way, is this purpose for the public benefit? And they can come out with a yes or no answer. So this could be in theory how they tackle the question, but this is not how the common law jurisprudence has actually developed. Instead, what the court has done is split the requirement of public benefit into two sub-requirements or two aspects. And the first aspect is the demand the purpose in question be beneficial. And the second aspect is the demand the purpose in question is for the public or a section thereof. And we have this uh, quote here that says, there has never been an attempt comprehensively to define what is or is not of public benefit. It is possible, however, to discern from the cases two related aspects of public benefit. The first aspect is that the nature of the purpose itself must be such as to be a benefit to the community, so that is public benefit in the first sense. And the second aspect is that those who may benefit from carrying out of the purpose must be sufficiently numerous and identified in such manner as to const constitute what is described in the authorities as a section of the public. This is the public benefit in the common sense. So that's from the case of ISC versus Charity Commission from 2012. Now, both of these aspects need to be satisfied in order for a purpose to be for the public benefit. So this quotation just highlights that the public benefit requirement is divided into, two, into these two aspects. Okay, so let's explore this in a little bit more depth. 
and we're going to begin by talking about the benefit aspect. So specifically in this video, I want to focus a lot on this benefit aspect. And so what does this mean? So what does the benefit aspect actually demand? How can it be satisfied or fulfilled by a potentially charitable purpose? Now, a purpose satisfies the benefit aspect if it delivers a net benefit to society. In other words, if its pros outweigh its cons, such that on balance, it is a good thing. So the purpose must on balance be a good thing. That's the crucial point here. While net benefit must, in theory, be positively demonstrated, the majority of Section 3, Subsection 1 purposes are self-evidently beneficial, so proof of benefit is unnecessary. Now, at least in theory, then, a net benefit must be positively demonstrated. So, in other words, the court must be positively satisfied that the purpose in question is indeed beneficial. But, of course, the majority of potential charitable purposes, in other words, the majority of charitable purposes that fall within Section 3, Subsection 1 of the Charities Act, would be self-evidently beneficial. So, in such a case, the court wouldn't require positive proof of their benefit, and will just take it as clear or obvious that such benefits exist. For example, in the Charity Commission's guidance, they give an example of a self evidently beneficial purpose as a purpose to provide emergency aid in the consequence of a natural disaster. This is self-evidently beneficial such that the court wouldn't require any ed um, additional evidence of benefit to be adduced. In other words, they will simply hold the benefit aspect to be satisfied. When the benefit is not self-evident, the court must obtain evidence of the purpose's benefits and detriments and weigh one against the other in order to establish whether the purpose is on balance beneficial. So sometimes a benefit isn't self-evident. In other words, it is arguable or contentious. So a purpose has fallen under a category under section three, subsection one, but there is a real question as to whether the purpose delivers a net benefit to society. Now, in these cases, the court has to obtain evidence of the purposes, benefits and detriments. And their project then is to weigh the one against the other in order to establish the balance of advantage. So, in other words, to establish whether the benefit of the advantage outweighs its detriment and vice versa. If the benefit is weightier, then the benefit aspect is satisfied. If the detriment is weightier, then the benefit aspect is not going to be satisfied. And the purpose will not satisfy the public benefit requirement, so cannot be a charitable purpose under Section 2 of the Charities Act 2011. So when a benefit isn't obvious, this is going to be the project of the court. The court has to engage in this balancing exercise, weighing the good of the purpose against the bad in order to, to establish this net position. So, for example, the benefits of providing motorised transport for the disabled would be outweighed by the possible harm that would cause to the environment. And so we've got this quote again from ISC and Charity Commission, which says that the court has to balance the benefit and disadvantage in all cases where the detriment is alleged and is supported by evidence. And again, a purpose cannot be a charitable purpose where any detriment or harm resulting from it outweighs the benefit. Okay, and so we've got this idea of consequential effect. The court must include in the balance all a purpose's consequential effects. So in weighing up the good and bad of a purpose, the court must consider all the downstream consequences of pursuing the purpose in question. The whole terms and effects of the particular trust have to be considered and if its object involves consequences which, when duly weighed, are found injurious to the community, the trust cannot be charitable. So the court must consider all the consequences stemming from the fulfilment of the purpose. Now in this case here from 1969, providing private hospital care was held beneficial, in part because the purpose would relieve pressure on a neighbouring NHS hospital. So the purpose in this particular case was that of providing private hospital care. On balance, this purpose was held to be beneficial, in part because its downstream consequences would be to help relieve pressure on a neighbouring NHS hospital. 
So consequential effect can be a key consideration in the balancing of benefit against detriment in deciding if a purpose is for the public benefit. Measuring benefit. Now, often benefit and detriment won't be susceptible to quantification or measurement. So it is often the case that you cannot quantify or measure the benefit or detriment the purpose provides. This notwithstanding, it should always be possible to identify and describe how a charity's purpose is beneficial, which is from the Charity Commission's public benefit guidance. So the Charity Commission here says that even though um, it will often be the case that we can't you know, quantify or measure the particular benefit or detriment, it should nevertheless always be possible to identify and describe how a charity's purpose is beneficial. For example, the Charity Commission note that the purpose of displaying an art collection to the public will deliver a benefit. In other words, it develops a person's artistic taste. So we can identify or describe the benefit, but we could not really measure or quantify it. So we don't actually need to be able to measure or quantify a benefit or detriment in order to determine its you know, balance of advantage, whether it's good or whether it's bad. So let's look at a few cases to finish off where uh, the benefit aspect has not been satisfied. Now, in this case of Hummeltenberg from 1923, educating people to become spiritualist mediums was held not to be beneficial. So this purpose did not, on balance, deliver a benefit to society. The court assumed that this would fall under the heading of advancing education, but even so, it would fail to be a charitable purpose as it would fail the public benefit requirement. The court didn't really find any detriment stemming from the purpose, but they didn't find any benefit coming from it either. So on balance, the court, the court couldn't actually say whether or not this would provide a benefit to society. In the case of Repinion from 1965, Establishing a museum using material of no artistic or historical value was held not to be beneficial. Okay, and this is a, a great case. And in this case, the purpose was to establish a museum um, which had no historical or artistic value. So the artifacts put in the museum itself had no artistic merit at all. And the court held on the assumption um, the purpose advanced education some way. But the court held that it didn't actually deliver any public benefits. So it failed this public benefit aspect. And although there was no real detriment or benefit involved with this particular scenario or this particular purpose, on balance, there was no benefit either. So therefore, that aspect was not satisfied. And finally, we have this case of National Anti-Vivisection Society and IRC from 1948. Banning animal testing was held on balance to be detrimental. The purpose's detriment, loss of medical progress, was held to outweigh its benefit, the promotion of kindness to the public. So the purpose in question here was to ban animal testing, and this purpose was held on balance to be detrimental. The purpose clearly fell within section three, subsection two in this case, of advancing animal welfare, but could not satisfy the benefit requirement of Pub, you know, being delivering some sort of benefit to the public. The court found a detriment in this case, unlike the other two cases, and this was the loss of medical progress that would otherwise have been achieved through animal testing. But they also found a benefit, so if animal testing was banned, this would promote kindness among humans. And the court then weighed the benefit and detriment together, and the court held that the detriment far outweighed the benefit so the purpose was on balance detrimental, so could not satisfy the benefit aspect of the public benefit test. So that's going to be the end of this particular video, and that really was a good introduction to the public benefit requirement, and specifically looking at this benefit aspect. In the next video, we're going to be exploring the historical development of the public benefit requirement before diving into different areas in a little bit more depth. But if you have any questions at all about this particular video, then please leave your comments and questions below the video, and I'll get straight back to you. If you enjoyed the video, then make sure you give it a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you very much for watching.